Your Humanities Half Hour is brought to you by the Northern Marianas Humanities Council. Welcome to Your Humanities Half Hour. I'm Catherine Perry. Today we're talking about a project happening in the Marianas called Saipan, Land and Sea, Battle Scars and Sites of Resilience. And here to tell us more about this exciting project targeting educators in our community, our project director, Dr. Ann Swenson Tickner of the East Carolina University, and also one of our community members contributing as pretty much a resource to this project, also project member and author, Nancy Flood. Welcome to the show, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Tell us, Anne, about this project, what it is overall, and what it means to our community. Well, I'm honored to be part of this project, and thank you for this opportunity to talk about it. What it is is it's a sponsored program from the National um, Endowment for Humanities to bring educators um, together for a one-week residential program on the island of Saipan. We're really excited about it because it's the only one of its kind to come uh, to be sponsored on Saipan. And um, it's K-12 educators. We have um, educators from uh, Saipan and Rota, Guam, uh, and um, also from mainland. We have 21 states represented of educators um, over these two weeks that we're working together. What is the goal of this project? Oh, wow. I love that question. (laughs) The goal of the project is to think about the history and heritage of um, on and around the island of Saipan and to think about um, different voices and perspectives in the history and how that impacts American culture and history and to think about the landmarks and the significance of those landmarks here and how we can experience them firsthand. So for many of our educators who've never been to Saipan, this is an opportunity for them to bring that experience back into their classroom. You know, you really have assembled a great and diverse team for this project. Who else is part of the leadership? Right. So my colleague, uh, Dr. Jennifer McKinnon, um, from, also from East Carolina University, and that's really how I got involved in this project. Um, she brought me in on a project in 2017. and. In that project, we had a couple educators um, in the group who who were participants who said, let's do this for educators. And so that's how this project started. So Anna Yamada is part of that team. Fred Camacho is part of our team. Um, Genevieve Cabrera is part of our team. John Farrell is also part of our team. And then, of course, Nancy as well. I love it because looking at the schedule, it's a balance of classroom, sitting down, and what you would normally expect uh, some kind of teacher seminar to be, and a lot of activities and stuff, landmark visits, lectures, films, uh, pedagogical, did I say that correctly? Yes. yes. Okay. I learned that word, uh, cultural events, and really just like a hands-on experience. Nancy, how do you feel about being a part of this project, and what is your role? Well, first, I, I feel very honored and, um, and of course, very excited. I always um, feel so welcomed by the people here. It, and it was exciting to think even of, like, I felt like I was coming back home. So, again, thank you to all, all the people here. But what, what I was excited about is that it was a chance, again, to honor the people who have lived through those very hard times and honor their stories, hear their stories, and also a chance to pass on those stories. So it's a chance to um, look, at that, look at that, to talk about that, and, to, and try to understand what was going on and what, uh, what a tremendous challenge to be able to survive during that time of World War II, during the time of the invasion, uh, to be caught in the crossfire of two other nations fighting and not knowing uh, who to trust, what to believe, where is it safe, how can I protect my family, but also to hear to in the stories that we listen to that we can hear the the uh, perspectives of different of the different people who were so deeply affected and involved. 
I think the other honoring is that um, people who survived here were able to not only survive in physically, but also spiritually in terms of the um, uh, being able to rebuild, recreate, um, to hold on to their cultures, uh, and also to do that in, in a spirit of healing, in a spirit of forgiveness and going forward, uh, not in a, a holding on to anger that, and just more conflict, but let's rebuild and let's um, recreate what we once had. Beautiful. And I, I do agree, Saipan is a, a place where a lot of trauma has happened, but it's also a place where a lot of healing has happened also. Um and can I call you in? <laughs> um, tell us about some of the topics that um, you're covering with educators during this one week. It's two seminars, but one week exactly. each. Yeah. yeah. So we have about 36 participants in each one. So it's a lot of people in a short amount of time. And when you talked about the design of the program, that was intentional. We wanted to balance the how do I learn content and study it deeply through these themes, um, and then how do I go and experience what the island has to offer in terms of the tangible uh, heritage and history, and then how do I teach this to children, um, students, K-12 students. So we're looking at the themes of military perspective, but then also civilian perspective during the battle for Saipan and before Saipan, before the battle. Um, we're also thinking about indigenous history and what that means um, now in contemporary culture and how that intersects. And then we're also thinking about the overall theme of hard history or conflict history um, that is associated with, in particular, World War, World War II, um, but other conflicts that have happened. Now, in the second half of the show, we're going to have uh, one of our guests is going to be Fred Camacho, who could probably speak a lot to some of the places uh, that y the group is going to, as well as Dr. Jennifer McKinnon. Um, I wanted to ask if you could share a little bit about some of the reading you had um, under the pedagogical topics that kind of underscored the importance of getting of how much more children can learn when their learning is tied to their environment. Right. And that's a lot of what this program is about, is that place-based history, and so thinking about why that place matters, and what is it about the landmarks, and we will be seeing landmarks on the land, but then also in the sea, in the lagoon. Um, and so that pedagogical piece is thinking about how do you translate the history and the learning into tangible pieces for children to learn. And again, we have educators who work with very young children, and we have educators that work with um, with high school students as well. So we have to think about what's appropriate, but then also what is understandable in terms of learning as well. And you were mentioning before the show that this, the Marian has had like the strongest number of the highest number of applicants for this type of training across the nation. Right. So, um, so there are several of these types of programs happening this summer, and our program had a huge amount of applicants. And so, we're very fortunate to have a very deep pool of applicants. And many of our applicants are from Saipan, or Rota, or Guam, um, who are here with us. But we're also representing 21 states. Um, and so we have that 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 um, experience of meeting people from different geographical places and learning together in one place, and then thinking about taking that home as well. Mm. It's interesting that you would have a lot of applicants also from the states. What is their particular interest? That's a good question, and that's one of the questions we ask them when they apply. Why why this program? Why do you want to be involved? And so for some of our um, educators, they have a personal connection. They had a family member that was here. They have a family member that served um, during World War II. Or um, for others, it's not quite as personal. It's more professional. They're very interested in the topic. They don't know as much about the Pacific Theater, and in particular, the Battle for Saipan. Um, or they're thinking about it in how do I create spaces in my classroom that honor voices that are not always in um, history or textbook. Mm, I like that. We have something to share also with the rest of the nation. Mm -hmm. Now, Nancy, you uh, have a number of publications written about Micronesia. 
Are there any particular ones you're focusing on as part of this project, or how are you helping those stories and voices be heard? Well, there, there, there's one in particular that that have all the students, all the teacher students will have read is Warriors in the Crossfire, and that one I think you know, the the power of being able to tell a story where one can con- really connect and feel like they're they can relate to that main character and so, in a sense, get, get within the skin of that person and um, be in scene. Another way to be in place, to be in scene, when you can't be there yourself or uh, to experience it. But the other, And the other one that we'll be also talking about is um, Mariana's Legends, which were um, oral histories that... Um, from a whole variety of, of people here at different ages that um, I collected that talk about the, each person talking about a, a part of the culture that it was that is particularly meaningful to them. And so um, hearing, hearing in, one's, in their own voices and, and explaining a p- part of the culture that is important and also through story being able to, you know, Go beyond that envelope and be be here, even if you don't, if you can't come here physically. Mm-hmm. Well, you're off to a great start. Any final thoughts before you go? You know, as Nancy said, it, it feels like coming home. This is my fourth time on the island, and I, every time I'm here, I meet more people and feel like I'm 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 here, and I'm welcome here, and I'm honored to be part of this community while I'm here. Oh, they always are such a wonderful welcome, and today it was. It was especially uh, exciting uh, for me to share that this is such a special place. This is such a beautiful place. And all their excitement to see it and do it, and you just go, I'm so glad I have this to share with you, that the, the, this time of coming together. It was beautiful. Thank you both, and good luck on the rest of the week. Thank you. We'll be back with more after this break. In Northern Marianas Humanities Council, Bula Guinahania Puri Historian Marianas Zan Kutura. Sinyon Soda SCCN and Futmashon Gis on Mami website, nmhcouncil.org. Pat Besita Gi YouTube, Pat Facebook. Guajaloku Diferentes Class in Lev Luna Sinya on Farm. In Northern Marianas Humanities Council, Hazuzura Todu E Experiential Tautau. Welcome back to Your Humanities Half Hour. We were talking today about a teacher project, basically, putting them in touch with history and sites here in the Mariana Saipans, land and sea, battle scars and sites of resilience. And joining us in this half of the show are two additional project members, uh, no stranger to the Marianas or our show, Dr. Jennifer McKinnon, professor in maritime studies at East Carolina University, and also professor of caves in the Marianas, <laughs> a.k.a. the cave master, Fred Camancho. Welcome both. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yes, you are a professor, I think, at this point. Yes. <laughs> Jen, maybe you can start us off. What is your role in this one-week uh, project for teachers? So, um, so I'm here as an archaeologist who's been working in Saipan for some time, studying the sites underwater and then also on land. Um, and I'm really hoping to sort of introduce the teachers who are coming here and also the local teachers um, who might want to learn more about the history um, to some of the sites that are underwater um, and um, kind of explore this concept of landmarks because I, I feel like Saipan is a landmark and it has multiple landmarks and monuments across the island um, that really speak to its past and its history. And um, so some of those archaeological sites and physical mon- monuments and the landmarks that are on the land and underwater just sort of expose the teachers to that concept um, of landmarks and sites of resilience and battle scars so that they can take it back to their classroom and tell a portion of World War II history, um, which doesn't always make it into the textbooks um, and take some techniques away that they can use um, in the classroom to explore these sort of difficult concepts. 
And that's one thing great about the Marianas is you can touch, physically touch history, prehistoric history, World War II history. So it's a very uh, rich learning uh, site for teachers. Fred, you are taking places for a lot of them where they've never gone before. Caves. What What is your part here? My part would be basically to uh, show uh, new visitors to the island uh, places that are not necessarily uh, in tourist maps, um, but they're, they're all around us. Um, yes, I do specialize in, in, in cave sites, uh, but there are other sites along the way or you know, inside the cave itself that haven't been exposed. Um, just recently I heard a comment from staff from NBA that we need more more sites to visit on this island and I, in my head I'm going the sites are there we, it's there it just needs more exposure but I, I do believe in protecting some of them but there are also sites that literally anybody can walk to and visit it just needs some maintenance some caring and some exposing so I'll be taking people on what I call level one, level two, level three, level four. Yeah. <laughs> <Like> so, <laughs> okay. Different, um, different, different uh, experiences. Uh, level five will be hanging on ropes and rappelling into <laughs> a cliff, <laughs> cliff cave for them. So level one, what, level one site, level one, level two, level three. What, okay. what so, sites are there? So like uh, level two will be the cave right uh, next to the Sugar King Park or right inside the Sugar King Park. Up the stairs a little Up bit? Stairs, okay, little so bit. you got to do the stairs. That's the level. Yes, that's, that's what makes what it level two level okay two. level one would be just kind of like walk right into calabara calabara would, i would consider it okay uh, once you get down into the cave it, level four it becomes <laughs> a different level <laughs> yes I because know. yeah, there's, yeah. A, there's a basically a funnel system in the back that becomes level five okay uh, i have to ask yeah. a lot of us are familiar with the two caves you've mentioned are you taking them um to a cave that maybe most people aren't aware of uh, yes, I will be taking them to a sinkhole in the Banzai uh, site, Banzai area. And what is there that they can learn from? The, right there. Wow. It's not only a dump, but it's also a burial ground. Bones, uh, human remains are, are still there. Um, unexplored northerns are still there. Airplane parts are still there. Electrical Electrical uh, gadgets are still there. All dumped into this they sinkhole. Into this sinkhole. Mm. At one point, I pulled out a light bulb, intact. Just one light. I put it back, and I haven't seen that light bulb ever since. Mm. And on the light bulb, the brand is uh, Mazda in Industries. So you can read the writing on it, and I was told that you know. Put that into a socket and it'll probably turn on. Wow. Because it's one of those quality types. Um, but yeah, it's it became a, not only a dump site, but now it's becoming a regular site for uh, real cave spelunkers. Mm. Want to go down deeper and into these cavities that nobody really sees. What do you think is the impact on participants? Because you guys have taken people to sites, various groups of people to various sites for over a number of years. What is the impact on individuals that you have guided to these sites? Dehydration. <laughs> Heat stroke. Okay, that's not what I was thinking, but all right, let's start with the practical. Yeah. You, okay, you so it's hard. You, okay, so it's it's difficult. All right. It gets difficult, and yes, some of them are amazed at some of these sites. Some of these sites are are here on the island. Mm-hmm. I said there are. I've been to over two hundred caves on this island. There are more that I haven't seen. I want to visit those places, but I also want to show people um, some of these sites mm. that I've seen. Uh, bone collectors, historic preservation office, you know, historical tourists, um, uh, just our kids that are interested in visiting these sites. They need to learn what's out there. Mm -hmm. I'm not necessarily just uh, 
internet or something like that. Agreed, it's, yeah. It's there. It's there. If there's nothing to do, no, there's a lot to do. Mm -hmm. How about you, Jen, in guiding people either to the underwater sites? What do you feel is the biggest reaction people have? I mean, I think people are amazed that things are still there um, mm -hmm. after all these years. And like the idea that it feels almost like you're stepping back in time, um, you know, and the history feels more real, really, you know, whenever you can see these sites. Um, and then when we talk about the preservation and how they need to be preserved and sustained over time, people really get it whenever you show them a site that has been picked over um, and a site that has been pristine, you know, because not a lot of people have visited it and that kind of clicks in your mind, you know, people's mind when they get to visit different types of sites. Um, and you talk about, you know, why they need to be around for generations for our, you know, children and our grandchildren and how important those are because they've survived 70 plus years, you know, if we're talking about World War II or if we're talking about rock art, mm -hmm. um, you know, several thousands of years um, and we want them to continue to survive into the future. So I think that surprise, that living in history, that like tangible, you can see it and, and recall and think about the past um, is really important and also let's preserve it for the future too. So this question is not exactly related to to the ongoing project, but as two professionals who have really um, seen a lot of the sites and you know care about the sites and help other people learn about the sites, what do you do? Would you have any recommendations on what we could do as a community, as a government, as individuals? What would be your top recommendations to help preserve these sites? What do you think is needed most? Um, it's, it's hard because I want to say let's open it up and teach the community what's there, but it also invites uh, other elements. I've seen, uh, I've seen caves that have been uh, graffitied on. Um, I've seen artifacts disappear. Um, just recently I got a message from a nephew of mine that was showing me a picture of a uh, clavicle, a jawbone, and asking me if I uh, know about the jawbone. I said, yeah, I buried that under a couple of huge rocks just to make sure it's still there when I get back there. But because it was exposed, that, that tells me that somebody else is going into the sites and, and uh, moving things around. Um, I know that uh, the bone collectors know about the site, and I know about uh, the HBO knowing about this, the remains, but because of uh, either money or lack of um, um, you know, uh, specialists, archaeologists or anthropologists to survey the, the site, uh, and of course uh, permitting, uh, that kind of stops a lot of things. Um, they can go in and survey and it, it can become a win-win situation where they will do the survey and they will record everything that's on the site and then that will have some kind of digital or some kind of report written out about the site. So now we have a record of what was in there or what is in there. That opens up the area to other, other things. Uh, Calibera, for example, uh, some of the cave art has been uh, painted over or smeared over with mud or something, either intentionally or unintentionally, I don't know. Uh, but when, when you have, you know, historical writings uh, that dates back hundreds of years and then all of a sudden a can of spray paint kind of ruins that all for everybody. How do we protect that? Hard. Can't put uh, even the security guards that are out there. Some of them kind of refuse to be at the site after hours <laughs> because of stories, because of being out there isolated in, in nowhere land. And it's just them. How do you how do you protect it from on a twenty four hour basis? Mm really comes down to respect, I think. Like, every individual needs to respect 
the site and the significance of the site and what is it you guys hope the uh, educators you're working with over the next couple of weeks will take away from their time with you and the experiences they're going to have? I hope that they have a more well-rounded understanding of um, the islands um, and the history, the longevity, and the people who have been here, and then all the sort of colonial interventions that have happened on the island and how World War II impacted the island and how being in this space is still a contentious area today. Um, and, and all that past history is still, is still lived on the island. Um, I hope that they have a broader sense of who was involved um, in World War II, specifically um, the civilian um, you know, experience and all the others. And so I hope they walk away with a broader understanding of it, not just being a battle. That Saipan isn't just a battle between Japan and the U.S. That has a long history before that, and it has an incredible history of folks who participated in it that weren't on either side and were non-combatants and involved in that. Um, and then they, they take that back to their classroom, and they teach their students who might have a longing or a yearning to come and travel and visit Saipan, you know, in 15 or 20 years from now. So I would love to see it pass through the generations of their classroom and have people understand that long history as well as the complicated history and all the people involved. I know there are people listening who are thinking, man, how can I sign up? Which registration is full. It's for teachers, but there are opportunities for the public to come in here from you guys and some of the other experts. Absolutely. So um, there are some evenings that are open to the public, and I would encourage people to check the newspaper um, because we have put out some advertisements for those um, evening participations at American Memorial Park. So if you're interested in coming out um, and participating, those evening sessions are open to the public, so check the local newspapers. Any particular partners you'd like to thank for this um, project? Yeah, Professor Fred. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Anna. Oh, hey, wow. Professor <laughs> Anna. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, well, you know, so American Memorial Park is a huge supporter of this, as is Garapan Elementary School. Um, that's where most of the activities are taking place that aren't in the jungle or underwater. Um, and uh, Saipan Submarine is supporting us with the vessels, and, um, and we've gotten support from the Historic Preservation Office and also the Marianas, uh, the Humanities Council. So thanking all of those who have been a whole island for being in. Uh, yeah, yeah. True. Allowing us to do, I mean, there are private owners that I've approached and allowed me to visit sites, uh, not only on their property, but also beyond their property. I just have to access it through their property. So I want to thank those uh, people that have allowed me to do what I do and continue to do what I do. Um, um, yeah, um, my wife. <laughs> <laughs> Good my call. Wife. <laughs> <laughs> Don't pour <laughs> <laughs> Thank you both so much, um, not only for this interview, but for really making your knowledge available to our educators and the community at large. I know you guys are always very generous with your knowledge, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. We've been talking today about the project Saipan's Land and Sea Battle Scars and Sites of Resilience happening now in the Marianas. This has been your Humanities Half Hour. I'm Catherine Perry. This program was supported by a We the People grant awarded to the Northern Marianas Humanities Council from the National Endowment for the Humanities. Any views, findings, conclusions, or recommendations expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily represent those of the National Endowment for the Humanities or the Northern Marianas Humanities Council.